Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to tell you something about the SESAME project. So SESAME stands for Synchrotron Light for Experimental Science and its Applications in the Middle East. It's a two and a half GeV synchrotron uh, light source under construction near Amman in Jordan. It's something like a two, generation 2.5. State of the art in synchrotrons are generation three. This will not be the best in the world, but it is certainly capable of doing world-class science and winning a Nobel Prize for somebody with the right idea for an experiment. The members of SESAME are Bahrain, Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, the Palestinian Authority, and Turkey. Iraq is considering joining. And there are a number of countries who send observers to the Council, including, well, they are France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Japan, Kuwait, Morocco, Portugal, Russia, Sweden, UK, and the USA. And for me, it was encouraging that the USA was pleased when Iran joined the project. The purposes of SESAME are first to foster excellent science and technology in the Middle East and to prevent or reverse the brain drain and second, to build bridges between these diverse countries and societies. So I will first say something about synchrotron radiation for those of you who are not familiar with it and why this is a good project to put in a developing country. Second, since one of the aims is building political bridges, I'll look at a few examples of, to see whether that's worked in the past. And then I'll tell you the Sesame story and the status of Sesame. So synchrotron, whoop, your device, ah, you've gone too f <laughs> Doesn't work your device, John. Works if you push the mic button. Ah, use this instead. Okay. Doesn't want to work properly. Oh, you can uh, go with this way. Okay, so. fine. Uh, so synchrotrons are sources of x-rays. X-rays were discovered by Röntgen in 1895. Here's a picture of his laboratory. Interestingly, Röntgen, when he made his discovery, was the president of Würzburg University, doing research in the evening. I don't know if there are any examples in the world of people doing work of this quality, uh, presidents of universities today. Uh, here's his apparatus. One of the interesting things about... How oh, it's going the wrong way again. Yeah, here we are. One of the interesting things about uh, x-rays is how quickly the knowledge spread and how quickly it was applied. Uh, this is a picture of Röntgen's wife's hand and her wedding ring, taken a few days after he discovered x-rays. And within two months, it was being used the other side of the world in New York for medical reasons. This is a picture of a gentleman who, while on a hunting trip, was so unfortunate as to discharge his gun into his right hand. So it's being used in medicine immediately. And one of the strengths of synchrotron radiation is it's very applied and very broad. Um, synchrotron radiation is uh, emitted in uh, accelerators by bending magnets and devices called wigglers and undulators. It's rather simple to understand. If you think of an electrically charged particle, if my hand was an electrically charged particle, it has surrounding it an electric field, the Coulomb field. As the particle moves, it carries the field with it, and there is energy in that field. If the particle is suddenly bent, the, uh, radiate, the energy in the field, some of it cannot respond fast enough and goes straight on in the form of radiation. So if you accelerate or move a charged particle, some of the energy in the field is shaken off in the form of electromagnetic radiation. So in a, an accelerator, as the particle goes round the accelerator, there is a searchlight, a beam of light, a very intense light, focused light, being emitted all the way around. And in certain places, one can put what are called wigglers or undulators, which wiggle the beam up and down and make more concentrated light in the forward direction. Ah, how? This thing is a terrible response. Yeah. Sometimes slow. Just push it a number of times you want and be patient. Right. 
I am not patient, <laughs> as those who know me know. So this shows you the spectrum of light uh, from the visible uh, right down to the atomic scale. And synchrotron radiation is in the X-ray range right up to the infrared. So the wavelength of this radiation is matched to cells, viruses, DNA, atoms. So synchrotron radiation can be used in medicine, in biology, in proton crystallography. It can be used in solid state physics to examine semiconductors. It can also be used in archaeology. So it's an extremely wide range of applied science. There are over 50 synchrotron light sources in the world today, but very few in developing countries, and none in the Middle East, although there will be sesame. So the purposes of this are to create a world-class interdisciplinary research laboratory, promote basic and applied research and technology. And as I said, since this goes across physics, engineering, biology, uh, medicine, uh, etc. This is a very, very good source of training in applied fields and developing the technical infrastructure to run this device. Uh, they can address specific regional issues of biomedical and environmental concern and uh, particularly train graduate students who will not have to go abroad and maybe bring people back from abroad. And on top of all these points, you, in this case, use scientific cooperation to promote peace and understanding uh, between different uh, people from different traditions, religions, races, and political systems. So then we can ask, has this ever worked before, building bridges? And I give you CERN is the, probably the first example. There's not been much analysis of this, but there was a nice conference organized 10 years ago by the New York Academy of Sciences on the role of scientists in mitigating international discord, and I'll just give you some headlines from that. A very important point is that it's, if you want to build bridges, you must build them on firm foundations. It's absolutely essential that you're doing world-class science, and there's a case for doing world-class science. If you do that, you can build bridges on it. But if you try to make any old science and use it to build bridges, it's not going to work. So the case of CERN was conceived just after the Second World War in the late 1940s when two ideas came together. Physicists who realized they could not afford the facilities on their own, they had to collaborate, and that is the same in the Middle East. And secondly, a far-sighted group of people who conceived the idea of a joint project to build bridges between countries which only at the beginning of the ideas of CERN four years ago had been fighting each other. It worked scientifically. Did it work in bridge building? Well, first of all, bringing the young people there together uh, works. They make networks. It doesn't seem much now in Europe. The young people network, move around. But in the 50s, that was not so common. And it built understanding between the young people and the students, many of whom then went outside science. It was the first intergovernmental organization to which Germany joined after the war, very much on probation. Do they know how to behave? That was the question from the other countries. The answer was yes. Other European scientific organizations were modeled on CERN. Uh, I've listed some there, and perhaps with Sesame, it could be a model for other organizations in the Middle East. Uh, it kept scientific relations with Russia and other East Bloc countries open during the Cold War. There have been joint summer schools bringing students together across the Iron Curtain, since the, as it then was, since the 1970s and uh, Russian particle physicists could stay in Russia because they could work at CERN. In high energy physics, they did not all emigrate to the West. So there's a number of ways in which I think CERN did work. What about in other areas? Uh, certainly scientists played a big role in the nuclear arms control negotiations, and those worked, I think, because the scientists on each side knew each other's scientific work, so they had confidence in each other. Uh, space cooperation was very explicitly launched with a lot of rhetoric about international understanding. The International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna was started by Lyndon Johnson specifically as a bridge building activity, and there are others. And there are scientist initiated activities. Cooperation between the US and China started at the scientific level, the Pugwash movement, uh, Israeli Palestinian context, uh, contacts 
And finally, the role of scientific cooperation in normalizing Israeli-Egyptian relations, uh, which uh, was built also on a congressional initiative that provided funding. So that brings me to the beginnings of Sesame, which started with this initiative from the Egypt-Israeli Peace Accord. That had an annex which provided $7 million for collaboration in agriculture, marine sciences, health, and energy. Uh, the next step in uh, the Sesame story was when Sergio Fubini and Eliezer Rabinovici and others uh, arranged a meeting in 1995 in Cairo to discuss collaboration between Israel and Arab countries. And this led to the establishment of the Middle East Scientific Committee. In 1997, the idea that was at the core of Sesame came from Hermann Winnick at the Stanford Linear Accelerator and Gus Voss at the Deutsches Elektron and Synchrotron in Hamburg, who suggested to the Middle East Scientific Committee that the 800 million volt Berlin synchrotron, Bessie, might be moved to the Middle East. Uh, that's a picture of Gus Voss and Hermann Winnick with Eliezer Rabinovici between them. So this is a short history. 1997, the first idea moved this device being closed in Berlin to the Middle East. In 1999, UNESCO uh, offered to be the parent organization and convened a meeting uh, in Paris at which Herwig Schopper was elected president of the Sesame Council. In 2000, uh, a site was chosen among competition between sites in a number of countries. Uh, the site near Amman was chosen. And at the same time, a rather far-sighted step was taken to put resources into sending scientists to be trained. So 18 scientists were sent abroad to be from the Middle East to be trained in Germany, the UK, Italy, at Grenoble, in France, uh, and at, in Stanford, uh, who have come back and are now building the device. It formally came into existence, it was endorsed by UNESCO in 2002, and in that year, the important decision was taken not to use the Bessie synchrotron as the main ring. It was being closed for a good reason. It was no longer world class but to use it as the injector, the first stage for a more powerful instrument, which really would be world class, the thing that's being built. Official opening and then the birth. I show you some pictures. This is the Bezzi synchrotron in Berlin. This will, is now being reassembled as the injector. The microtron is the first stage, and this will be a small ring that will inject into a big new ring. This is where the site is. Uh, about 15 kilometers from Amman. This is a picture of the site before the building went up with a girls' college which will be handed over to Sesame. The Sesame building, I'll show you in a minute, is in the bottom right-hand side here. This is a picture of the groundbreaking ceremony, the King of Jordan in the middle and various personalities connected with Sesame. This is a picture of the a user's meeting. There have now been six user's meetings, bringing together the, to form a user community, be ready to do experiments when Sesame is completed. The user's meetings typically attract about 125 people, something like that. So there is a community there ready to use Sesame, discussing how to use it. This is a picture of the joint beam lines and science committees. The lady in red is Zara Seyes, she's Turkish, who chairs the, the science committee. And on the right of the front row, Samar Hasnain, who works in the UK, who uh, chairs the Beamlines Committee, or did, no longer does. This is a picture of the Director General of the IAEA visiting um, the site last spring. Now I want to show you two slides that tell you uh, why I got involved. Well, first, here's the building. So Sesame exists in the sense the building is there, paid by the Jordanian government, who is also providing the infrastructure. Now, one of the founders of this, Eliezer Rabinovici, is a string theorist. I don't think he knows what a synchrotron is and, uh, or what synchrotron radiation is for. He's born in Jerusalem, but he's a passionate believer in collaboration across the political boundary and has been at every meeting since the beginning. And this time last year, in fact, I think on this date last year, he flew to England at his own expense to persuade me to be involved. And one of the things he has written in an article that I like very much is this. 
He says, as a string theorist, I work on parallel universes. I was always curious about what a parallel universe was like, and now I know. I'm living in one when I go to Sesame meetings. And I can tell you, to go to the council meeting and you find an Israeli, a Palestinian, an Iranian who become friends talking over dinner, it's very inspiring. And the idea is to have several hundred young people from these different countries working together, learning about each other's cultures, doing great science, and also building bridges between the countries. This is the second thing that uh, persuaded me to be involved. Uh, at the middle of April last year, I went to visit Sesame to try to see is it real or not, and I met the young team of people who are building it from across the region. These are people who I do not think will be in the Middle East if Sesame didn't exist. They would have emigrated. And their enthusiasm was a real inspiration. You cannot avoid wanting to help them. So the machine itself will be uh, about 125 kilo uh, meters in circumference with various beam lines where light is taken out from these wigglers and so on. I just give the parameters here in case there's anyone knows about synchrotron radiation. This next picture shows you inside the building, so the square surround is that big blue building I showed you. Here is the ring in the middle. Here are the various experiments uh, that are going to be set up. Uh, the current status of the phase one beam lines, I'm not going to talk about the science, but just to say, to give you an idea, the different groups who are leading them. So many countries are involved now. One beam line, the experiment's being led by a group from Pakistan, another from Jordan, another from Turkey, Jordan, and Israel, another by Sesame staff, and another by Egypt, Israel, UK. So there are champions for the different experiments who are beginning to build teams. And I'll tell you about the date. It may be ready in a minute. The directorate, the director is Khaled Tukan, who was, until a few months ago, all, as well as director of Sesame, the Minister of Education and the Minister of Science in Jordan. Very politically well corrected, connected. Scientific Connect director is Hafiz Surani, who unfortunately failed to get here. Uh, technical director, Amor Naji, and the administrative director just appointed, Mohammed Khalid. So these are really from across the different member states of Sesame. There are international advisory committees. I won't go through them. But again, you see people across the region helping Sesame and people from outside the region who are giving their time to help get this project underway. Uh, Sesame has benefited from a lot of donated equipment. Not only the Berlin synchrotron, but beam lines from Lyon, that's a synchrotron source in France, from Stanford, uh, from Berkeley, and most particularly from the UK, which last month signed an agreement to give, because the synchrotron in Dalesbury in the UK is being closed, equipment which if bought new would cost 15 to 20 million euros. And that essentially brings the beam lines for stage one to completion. Uh, just for completeness, this is the list of the donations, the details from the UK. Here's a picture of the visit which agreed on which equipment would be transferred from the UK to the Middle East, taking place a month ago. One of the essential objectives of Sesame is training. Uh, the machine experts, I said at the very beginning, 18 people were sent abroad, about 20 altogether had finished by 2004, and they've come back again. Training of beamline experts, training of scientists. There'd be many users' workshops, as I've said, but also special fellowships and a new phase with funding from the IAEA, which has provided three quarters of a million dollars over four years, to send people to various synchrotron sources around the world so they are trained and prepared to come back and work at Sesame. So what's the time schedule? In principle, Sesame could start working in about 2010. But there is one thing missing, which is money to complete the project. I'll come back to that on the next slide. The beam lines are ready. This is very unusual for a synchrotron. Because they've been donated, the beam lines are certainly going to be ready. The machine may not be ready. This is thanks very much to Jordan. The king has put a lot of his own special development fund into this, uh, is keeping it going, and uh, to the director, but also to the main donors, which besides Jordan, they're now the UK and Germany giving basic. 
So what is the problem? The members originally signed up in the expectation that they would not have to contribute to the capital cost. It was said the main machine will be Bessie. There is no capital contribution needed. You need only contribute to the running cost. When the design was upgraded it was decide and decided to add a new ring, it was assumed that the European Union would provide the money. This was partly because it was a study set up by the European Union which recommended making a new uh, ring and making a genuinely world-class machine. It was a correct recommendation. The trouble is the money has not followed. It was a false belief that the EU would fund it. They've put 1 million euros, but there's about 15 million missing. The members are generally not rich countries. The only country with oil in that list is Iran. Uh, and this is even sharing the budget, the operation budget, which will rise to $5 million between those countries, is quite a big burden on countries that have very, very small science budgets. What are the possible sources of money? Uh, the EU, as I said, they reviewed the project. They said put a bigger ring. We're going back to them again with support from a letter signed by 27 Nobel laureates to ask again, can they contribute? Other developed countries could contribute. It's possible some foundations, the Ford Foundation, for example. There are corporations which do business in the Middle East, the big cement companies, for example. Many of them now have corporate social responsibility budgets and are supposed to show they put back money. We should be approaching them. I'm about to do it. Even individuals, rich individuals, might contribute to this. New members, maybe there are some countries here which would like to join. And I think existing members, Maybe it wouldn't be good if the EU gave all the money. It might be better if they said, for every million euros we give, the countries must match it. Because it's really important to get a sense of ownership in this project. In the last analysis, if the money does not come from outside, I believe that Jordan will pay for it. To have a Jordanian-funded project which opens its doors to others would be excellent but it would not be the same as having a genuinely cooperative project in which every country felt responsibility and membership. So that has to be the aim, is to find money not from Jordan, but from outside the region, possibly matched by money inside the region. In conclusion, and how can this group help? First of all, spread awareness of the existence and desirability of Sesame. It's not very well known, this project. But in my experience, almost everybody who hears about it thinks it's a great project. There is no synchrotron source in the Middle East. It will do good science. It will train young people in a very wide range, and it will build uh, networks across the region. Increase the awareness of the governments that belong to Sesame. Some of these countries, the joining was done at a relatively low level and they are lacking self-confidence. I don't think some of the members realize what a good project this is and how important it is. And they need to be convinced of its scientific importance and political importance so they can put more money. Help promote to the project to new members. And most important, help persuade the EU to contribute more. Uh, we are just approaching them. Um, Herwig Schopper and Tukan wrote a letter last week to the commissioner for external relations, Ferrero Waldner. And finally, uh, if people have ideas of potential donors, corporations, foundations, I'd be very helpful, uh, very much like to hear about them. So I think Sesame is an exciting project. Uh, by cost, most of it is now there. The injector, the pre-injector is there, the building is there, the beam lines are there. It just needs a little bit more money to get it finished and uh, make a reality of uh, what is a fantastic dream. Thank you very much.